Let's read God's word. Genesis chapter 22, the whole chapter here. Sometime later, God tested Abraham. He said to him, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Then God said, take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains I will tell you about. Early next morning, Abraham got up and saddled his donkey. He took with him two of his servants and his son Isaac. When he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he set out for the place God had told him about. On the third day, Abraham looked up and he saw the place in the distance. He said to his servants, stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. We will worship and then we will come back to you. Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and placed it on his son Isaac. And he himself carried the fire and the knife. As the two of them went on, went on together, Isaac spoke, spoke up and said to his father, to Abraham, Father, yes, my son, Abraham replied, the, the fire and the wood are here, Isaac said, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And the two of them went on together. But when they reached the place God had told him about, Abraham built an altar there and arranged the wood on it. He bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar, on top of the wood. Then he reached out his hand and took his knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called out to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Do not lay a hand on the boy, he said. Do not do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God, because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. Abraham looked up, and there in a ticket was he saw a ram caught by his horns. He went over and he took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called the place, the Lord will provide. And to this day it is said, on the mountain of the Lord it will be provided. The angel of the Lord called to Abraham from heaven a second time and said, I swear by myself, declares the Lord, that because you have done this, and have not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you and make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and sand on seashores. Your descendants will take possession of the cities of their enemies and through your offspring, all nations on earth will be blessed because you have obeyed me. Then Abraham returned to his servants and they set off together for Beersheba and Abraham stayed in Beersheba. Sometime later, Abraham was told, Milcah is also a mother. She has borne sons to your brother Nahor, Uz, the firstborn, Buzz, his brother, Camel, the father of Aram, Kesed, Hazad, Pildash, Jidlap, and Bethel, Bethuel. Bethuel became the father of Rebekah. Milcah bore these eight sons to Abraham's brother, Nahor. His concubine, whose name was Ruhum, also had sons, Teba, Gaham, Tahash, and Mahak. And let's pray, just before we get into, God, into God's word. Our Father, we come before this passage, and before you, and we, we come with this passage, your word for your people this morning, and we realise that it's, it's a difficult Difficult passage, it's a challenging word for us to interpret today. Yet, Lord, we ask for your spirit so we can interpret it rightly, so we can apply it rightly, and so that your spirit will be using your word to grow your church. In Jesus' name, amen. So, if you've been living under a rock or haven't noticed, the Olympics have been on for nearly a month now probably over a month actually, I think, at this stage. The Olympics are a great test of will and of endurance, of pushing the human mind and body to its limits. And while there are many sports that are popular in the Olympics, like handball and archery, almost none are as popular as track and field events. Whether it's hurdles, the 3,000 meter steeplechase, or the 100 meter sprint. These are testaments, pinnacles to mankind's fortitude, the pinnacle of physical difficulty. But as Shania Twain said, and I, I, I correspond with her here, that don't impress me much. <laughs> Any child can run 100 meters. Ruben can one, run 100 meters. 
Um, most of you here probably could do 3,000 meters. Maybe not very well, but it could be done. For me, the world of ultramarathons, while less exciting to watch, um, are a much greater test. Take, for example, the Montan Yukon Arctic Ultra in Canada, um, up at the very top there. 692 kilometers of running, over 6,000 meters of elevation, all in temperatures between minus 12 to minus 25 degrees Celsius. Or the Tour de Jean in Italy, 330 kilometers in distance, 24,000 meters worth of elevation, over 20 mountains climbed and summited in total. <coughs> they are the ultimate test for me. But while these may push the human mind, body and spirit to their limits, there is one greater test that I've read of before, and that's what we're going to look at today. The test of Abraham's faith, a mentally, physically exhausting challenge. Uh, Abraham's story is winding down. Uh, chapter 21, Isaac is born. The end of chapter 22, Isaac's wife has been introduced. That's what that genealogy at the end is all about. Um, chapter 23, Sarah dies. Chapter 24, Isaac marries. Chapter 25, Abraham dies. So chapter 22 really is the culmination of Abraham's personal story, his journey that started back in Genesis 12, when God said, go to the land, I will show you. God calls to Abraham one last time with his greatest challenge yet. And these, these, this chapter has the last words God gives to Abraham. God commands him, sacrifice your son. We'll deal a bit more with this command, the nature of this command later, but the significance of this is not lost on Abraham. Abraham's commanded to destroy that which he loves most in the world. Isaac, his only son, the son whom he loves. For Abraham, this was a complete, completely counterintuitive to everything he had experienced so far. We know that Isaac is Isaac is who Abraham has been waiting for all the time. And we also know that Isaac is who the promise will come true. In chapter 21, when he's born, born, it's confirmed. Isaac is who God will use to fulfill his promise. So why kill him? Abraham goes, and it's it's an agonizingly slow detail that this account, this is accounted to us. It's great storytelling for detention. Um, if you notice, it's very slow. He chops the wood, he saddles the donkey. And even more intense, it took three days to get there. So the whole time, this, this is obviously stewing in Abraham's head. Why sacrifice the boy on whom the whole of God's promise rests? Yet Abraham still goes. And we get a clue about why Abraham willingly went. In what he says to his servants in verse 5. When they arrive, they leave the servants. They take the supplies, but significantly, they leave the donkey. So the donkey is not the sacrifice. But in his instructions to his servants, he drops a hint of what he trusts and what he knows is going to happen. We will worship, but we will come, both come back to you. Me and the boy will go and worship, and we will come back to you. There is no amb ambiguity. Abraham expects Isaac to return. And this is, this is rather significant. And the author of Hebrews picks up on this in chapter 11, and he understands what Abraham's getting at. This is what he says here in Hebrews 11. It says, by faith, Abraham, when God tested him, offered Isaac as a sacrifice. He who had embraced the promises was about to sacrifice his one and only son, even though God had said to him, it is true, Isaac, your offspring will be reckoned. Abraham reasoned that God could even raise the dead. And so in a manner of speaking, he did receive Isaac back from death. God could raise Isaac from the dead, and Isaac would make the walk back with the servants. Abraham realized nothing is impossible for God. The God, the God who gives his promises is faithful to complete them and nothing, nothing can stop him. That even in death, God could raise Isaac and fulfill his covenant. Abraham is, especially from this passage, often argued to be the supreme example of blind faith, of trust in God even when it seems irrational. But that's a romantic view of obedience to the Lord. Just like someone who does one of those ultramarathons, they do not do it the first time round on their first attempt, but instead they've been tested through smaller, also difficult races. 
God does not start with this command to Abraham in chapter 12. Instead, he ends with it in chapter 22. The reason Abraham realizes God can conquer even death is not based on blind obedience, but instead on reasoned faithfulness to God's command. Remember what Abraham has experienced since chapter 12. God calls him in chapter 12. God spoke to him again throughout visions, physical signs, through angels, and even in human forms. Abraham has heard the voice of God throughout his life, and he knows it. Also think about as Abraham has seen and experienced, how God has blessed Abraham, how he's rescued him against the odds, the miracles he witnessed, like the birth of Isaac and the destruction of Sodom. How God has shown him his character and his power throughout all this. Abraham's decisions here are not born out of ignorance, but out of knowledge of God and who he is. Returning to the narrative though, Abraham takes the knife and the fire. Isaac takes the wood. Ever since he left the servant, though, something has been playing on Isaac's mind. Where is the burnt offering? Where's the ram, the goat? Abraham replies with more wisdom than he actually knows. God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And again, we get into an insight into why Abraham is willing to sacrifice Isaac. God will provide the appropriate sacrifice. Abraham is open to God's methods, whether it's Isaac or something else. God will provide the appropriate sacrifice and God will fulfill his promise through Isaac. This does bring us to another misunderstanding of the passage though, and that is that God is cruel. It's often leveled at the Bible that God is cruel. And people generally point to, we need to say, we need to go no further than the story of Isaac and Abraham. There's other popular ones to go to, but Isaac and Abraham's a big one. Um, but there's a number of missed points or misconceptions, um, and we can only touch on these very briefly in one or two lines. First, is that God is the standard by which all morality is judged. It is God who decides what is and isn't moral, and it's him and his goodness that can decree that. Second, God is king over his creation. He can judge it. Third, Abraham did not think Isaac would stay dead, as we pointed out earlier. Fourth, this incident was used to show us something about Jesus to Abraham, Israel, and to us. It was to show us about Jesus, which we will talk about later. Um, and fifth, God has shown himself again and again to be good. He is not capricious. And Abraham, he knew this. So he trusted the goodness of God, even in his command. And sixth, the point of this is not the actual sacrifice itself. Instead, from the start, this was a test. So that's very briefly your response to that. But we do learn a lot about Abraham's faith from this test and the nature of continuous, and fit, continuous faith in God from this. And I stress the fact that what we're learning about here is faithfulness, about continuous faith. We are not talking about the act of faith itself, the one that justifies us in Christ Jesus, that once for all action, but rather what it means to walk in faith after that. Abraham is viewed as the exemplar of faith for both Christianity and Judaism, and how he left his home for a land that God had promised, and how he served God until then. But remember, in between then, there's been a lot of bumps. Twice Abraham lied about Sarah being his sister. He also doubted God's promise about Isaac and had a son via Hagar, who's Sarah's servant. Yet here Abraham is tested and he stands up. His relationship with God has changed him over time. He has learned greater obedience to God, but also greater knowledge of God's will and character. So when he is called to sacrifice Isaac, he obeys because he knows that God is good and will fulfill his promises through Isaac. So continuous faith changes us as we know God more. Second, continuous faith requires there to be no others. For Abraham, as an older man in the ancient Near East, his only child, his only son, would have been special. And more special than this, more special than any riches. And this is all heightened by the fact that Isaac was Isaac's birth and Isaac's future is miraculous. Yet God asks Abraham to get rid of that. If you trust me and love me, you will do as I command. For us, there is a lot we can learn about our own walk of faith.